morning, Waterloo. Good morning. Good morning to everybody that is in Kitchener, everybody that might be in Westside, everybody in Chatham. We're so glad that you're joining us. My name's Pete. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Creekside, and we're in the middle of this series called He Gets Us, which is a series about how Jesus understands what it's like to be human because he was and is still human, which should boggle the mind because I don't know if we always think of him this way. I mean, do you realize, like Jesus knows what it's like to sit down and have a great meal. Jesus knows what it's like to like, dip your body into a body of water, like the feeling of water on your skin. He knows what it's like to be tired, what it's like to be tired and to lay down and to drift off to sleep. And he knows what it's like to wake up and to need to pee, <laughs> but, but to also not want to get out of bed. He, he knows that, 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 that conversation that happens in your mind every morning. You're going to think about that every time you wake up now. You're going to be like, Jesus felt this way too. Oh, what should I do? He, he, knows, he knows what it's like to grow. He knows what it's like to age. He knows what it's like to go through puberty. Have you ever thought about Jesus going through puberty? Did Jesus' voice crack? Imagine that sermon. That's a sermon we haven't heard yet. The sermon where Jesus taught and his voice was all crackly as the hormones changed his body. Interesting. Jesus gets us because Jesus was one of us and is still one of us. And so we've been looking at different ways that he gets us. And today I want to talk about something that happens to all of us, happened to Jesus a ton, and that is the experience of being misunderstood. And eventually we're going to get a little bit deeper that, that moves beyond just being misunderstood. It also moves from misunderstood to mistreated to, to mocked and ultimately rejected. But let's just begin with the experience of being misunderstood. We're misunderstood all the time. If you're married, you know what this is like. If you have a, a close friend, you know what this is like. You, you get into a text conversation and you're, you're like, your tone was like aloof, but they took it really serious. And suddenly you're in a big fight and you're like, what happened? Oh, I don't know. I thought we were just texting. This happens to me with my kids all the time. I have, I have three kids, nine, eight, and five. And the nine and eight-year-old are boys. And because they're so close in age and maybe because they're boys, they're, they're constantly trying to figure out, like, who is dad's favorite? Which, which is a biblical theme that I never realized how important it was until I had two sons. And so the middle son, Ezekiel, we call him Zeke, he, he is triggered by this a little bit more, I think, because when you're the middle son, you're the middle child, apparently you want everything to be more fair, and he's always, so he's always listening to see, like, is he getting the same treatment as his older brother Eli? And so if I bring something home and, and I give the thing to Eli first, he's like, how come I didn't get one? And sometimes I'll have one for him. I'll be like, I got you one too. And he's like, mm, yeah, if I didn't, if I hadn't have asked, would I have? Like, he's very... He's very suspicious that he is on a lower, the lower pecking order. If I, if I serve them dessert, and I'm handing out dessert, and it happens to go to Eli first, how come he gets it first? I'm like, I'm just trying, I have to give somebody for, he's always on the, to the level that he is like so attuned that one time he misunderstood something completely, got it completely backwards. So, so Eli has this habit of, because he likes basketball, he's realized that it's really fun when you have dirty dishes to just throw them into the sink. From whatever distance, I mean, the greater the distance, the, the more the, the feeling of success if you make it into the sink. And so he'll, he'll throw, and we're like, you cannot throw dishes in the sink. What are you doing? And so one time he, he's doing this, and he's done it so many times. And, and so I begin to, to rebuke him for this with the words, Eli, I've told you so many times. And from the other room, Zeke says, you never tell me nothing. I'm like, which as you can imagine has become a line in our house that will never die. Never tell me nothing. Oh, you even like you care about me enough to rebuke me, Dad? Come on. You never tell me nothing. Man, being misunderstood. Jesus was misunderstood all the time. You could put this lens, once you kind of put this lens on your reading of the gospels, of the life of Jesus, you realize this is everywhere. Almost everything the guy says, he's getting misunderstood or just people don't understand it at all. When he's a little boy and he goes to the temple and he's 12 years old 
And he stays at the temple, and his parents leave him there. And then three days later, they finally eventually find him. And they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And he's like, I had to be, like, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And it says his parents didn't understand what he was talking about. From the very beginning, he's misunderstood. I want to show you a passage in the, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8, where Jesus is with his disciples. And it is a, it is a time when his disciples clearly are, they don't understand Jesus. And I hope that as we read through it, well, I hope, I think that as we read through it, you're going to realize, I don't think I understand what's happening either. It's a time when Jesus has, has, in the book of Mark, he's already performed two really big miracles where he feeds 5,000 people with just a little bit of food. And then he feeds 4,000 people with just a little bit of food. And then the religious teachers come to him and they ask for a sign. And he's like, you guys, in these signs, like, haven't you been paying attention to what I've been doing? And he tells the religious teachers, I'm not going to give you a sign. You're not going to get the sign that you're looking for. And then after all of this happens, he's with his disciples and they have this exchange. So then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. So he's with his disciples on a boat and they've just left these religious teachers who are asking for a sign. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Like Jesus is trying to tell them, like, be careful that you don't have this need for a sign like the Pharisees. And and they're like, he's talking about bread, right? How much bread? We all got one loaf. Is it because because we have no bread? What's what's Jesus? They're, they're confused already. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, "Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened?" To which I think they'd all be like, "I don't know if our hearts are hardened, but we don't understand. Could you could you speak more plainly? Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember?" When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketful of pieces did you pick up? They answered, uh, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? You get it, right? 5,000, 12 loaves, 4,000, seven, yeah, yeah. 5,000, 12, 4,000, seven, yeah, I get it. I gotta be honest, I don't get it. I, I read lots of commentaries, and you know what? Nobody really gets it. <laughs> There's some ideas around what these numbers might mean. There's a simple explanation that Jesus is trying to say, hey, don't worry about bread, because I can make bread. <laughs> I don't know if you've been paying attention. That's the simplest explanation. Maybe the numbers have a deeper understanding. But this is like just such an easy lens. Once you put it over, Jesus is teaching, you realize, oh, this is happening to him all the time. He's constantly being misunderstood, even by the people closest to him who want deeply to be able to understand him. But I don't want to just talk about these general misunderstandings this morning. I want to talk about the misunderstandings that happen when there's the part of Jesus that is the visionary part of Jesus, the revolutionary part of Jesus, the the wanting to bring something new into the world part of Jesus, when that part of him gets misunderstood. Do you know what that feels like? When there's something like inside of you, there's something being birthed inside of you, there's something, something good and beautiful inside of you, and you feel like you want to bring it into the world, but it's constantly misunderstood. Maybe, you, maybe you're a business owner, you're an entrepreneur, maybe you just work inside of an organization and you have a new vision for how things could be done differently. And you bring that thing from within you out into the world and you hope and you, and you think that maybe other people will go, that thing that you have offered to us, wow, if we rearranged this in this way, if we started treating people like this, if we started implementing this new idea, wow, that would be amazing. And instead you bring it out and people go, that's a dumb idea. I don't get it. You know that feeling of seeing something broken in the world. You see like the need for food, the need for resources, the need for justice. And you're like, we should do something to help that. Shouldn't we do something to help fix this broken problem, fix this injustice? And people are like, no, 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 no. let's just watch Netflix. I don't, I don't really care as much as you. That feeling of being misunderstood and then like rejected. 
Do you know that, do you know that feeling? Like, like the feeling of, I want to create something. You're an artist. You want to paint something. You want to write something that will change the world, that will move people's hearts. And people are like, haven't you heard of chat GPT? Only a couple people, I guess. But haven't you realized robots are going to do all that? Robots are the future of artistic expression. Like that we're gonna, we don't have to write anymore. We have robots to do that kind of thing. I have this all the time when I'm writing sermons and I'll come up with ideas for illustrations, like physical illustrations. And that feeling of like, I think I have this great idea. And then you share it with someone and they go, that's not going to work. And this happens to me when I share things with my wife. Because I'll try to give her like a bit of the idea and I'll be like, what do you think? Should I do this? I'll be like, I'll be like I need your yoga ball because I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have Brennan stand next to me and hold this yoga ball over his head for like 20 minutes during the sermon. Won't that be good? Like to illustrate what it's like to live under the weight of the law. And, that, and she's like, I don't think you should do that. I'm like, I'm doing it anyway. It's gonna be great. People are gonna love it. I remember I asked her one time, I was, I was like, because if I share stories about our, about our marriage, I'll ask her first. So if you ever hear a story and you're like, who's going to get in trouble for that one? I'm like, no, Pete's already asked permission. <laughs> but so, which I think is fair. Yeah. So I asked her one time, I said, I, said, I want to share that story about that one time when, uh, when, when I noticed that the counters were dirty. And, and how I, I tried to nicely say, like, like have, you, have we just decided to stop cleaning the counters? Remember, remember I shared that in a sermon like a year or two ago. And, and I, I was like, don't you think I'm going to share that to talk about marriage and how communication is difficult? And she goes, people are going to think you're a jerk. And I'm like, <laughs> but I said, no, no, it's called relatability. Like they'll think I'm a jerk, but that's good. And then they'll be like, oh, he's a normal guy. Maybe we can listen to something. He has to say. Do you know the feeling of like, I have something inside me that is good and beautiful. I want to bring it into the world. But as you do that, it gets misunderstood. It gets mocked. It gets mistreated. It gets rejected. Jesus knows that feeling. And I think John sums it up for us in a, in a verse that I want to hang this morning on. John opens up his gospel by talking about Jesus and how Jesus existed before all things. How he sat with the Father before anything was created. And as he goes through his introduction, he eventually gets to this great line. He says, the light, referring to Jesus, shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome or understood it. Depending on your translation, you may get either one of these words. I think that they're both helpful in understanding the Greek word being used here. He's saying that Jesus, from the beginning, was like light shining into the darkness. And as that light went into the darkness, the darkness both couldn't overcome it, but the darkness also couldn't understand it. The Greek word, actually, the most literal translation would be to lay hold of, to grasp him. Jesus, from the very beginning of his ministry, of his time on earth, was light shining into the darkness, constantly being misunderstood. Which means he knows exactly your experience of feeling like there is something inside you, some light inside you that as you bring it out, it's just, it feels like it gets swallowed up by darkness. Which leaves you feeling like, I wish I... I wish I never would have brought that out in the first place. Jesus' central proclamation about the kingdom of God, which was a proclamation that God was doing something new in the world through him, that God was showing up to heal the world, to make the world look like how it was supposed to look in the first place. This central proclamation about the kingdom being here, being near, beginning, was constantly misunderstood. Imagine what it must have been like for Jesus as he just tried to teach them the kingdom is here. It just doesn't look like what you think it looks like. The kingdom is here. The king just doesn't look like how you think he's supposed to look. Imagine what it would have been like as he constantly shared, brought this light into the world, and people didn't understand it. And people mistreated it. And people mocked it. And people rebuked him and rejected him. Jesus' own family in Mark chapter 3, it says that Jesus has begun his ministry. He's begun and he's done some miracles. And he's in a house with a group of people. And you imagine people just like flooding in to hear Jesus. And imagine he's teaching about the kingdom. 
And it says that his own family shows up because they believed that he was out of his mind. His mother and his brothers show up and they're like, don't worry, we're here to take him home so that he can get better. Do you know what it's like to have people that are the closest to you not understand you? Jesus' own family thought that he was out of his mind. Jesus, as he proclaimed this kingdom, would say that it would be much slower to be revealed than people were expecting. That it would come in this, this hidden sort of way. And people were looking for, no, no, let's do it now. And let's make it big and loud and violent. Let's, let's do it. And Jesus is like, no, no, my kingdom happens more slowly and it happens in this hidden way so that those who come into this kingdom have to come in by trusting. The way into this kingdom will be by faith. Not by seeing something big and loud and flashy, but by trusting in Jesus' words that something new is here. And I can trust in it and I can begin to learn how to move in this new kingdom. People were looking for a king, a warrior type king. And Jesus was the opposite of a warrior type king. He was a humble servant who ultimately would die on a cross, which was his way of teaching this kingdom. The people that are first in this kingdom, the king of this kingdom, won't be the person who takes the most for himself. The king of this kingdom will be the person who gives away the most. The king of this kingdom will be the person who sacrifices the most. Jesus had this line, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so the first in the kingdom of God will be the person who is last, the person who gives away the most, the person who sacrifices the most. And so who is first in the kingdom of God? Jesus, because Jesus sacrifices the most. But people heard this and they saw this and they saw a king dying on a cross. They're like, we don't want that king and we don't want that kingdom. And it was misunderstood and the light that he brought in was swallowed up by the darkness. Jesus proclaimed who was, who was in, who was going to be invited into this kingdom. People had ideas about, but well, when God shows up, there'll be these clear lines and we know, we know who will be in and who will be out. In fact, we've already started the process for God on God's behalf. We've already been kicking the people out that we believe won't be in here. And Jesus comes and he keeps welcoming people from the edges, welcoming people, touching people that are unclean. And several times throughout the gospels, the religious teachers, as they're watching him say this line or something akin to it, this man welcomes and eats with sinners and tax collectors. What's going on? Like they never say it directly to him. They seem to say it when he's like in earshot. They say to him, this, your rabbi, he eats and drinks with sinners. He's talking about a kingdom. He's talking about God doing something new in the world. And it seems, it seems to not really go with the people that he's with. Like, like we were expecting an all-star team of religious people. And we come to this house and, and he's with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the drunkards. What's going on here? And at one time when Jesus was actually having a meal at a tax collector's house. And he hears the religious teachers say this. He says to them, oh... You, you think that I've come for the righteous. I haven't come for the righteous. I've come, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Because you see, you see, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people need a doctor. And what he was trying to teach them was that in this kingdom, the way into this kingdom would be through surrender. The way into this kingdom wouldn't be the people who earn their way into the kingdom through some religious acts of piety. No, that's not the way into this kingdom. The way into this kingdom is to realize that you are far too sick to ever heal yourself and to simply surrender to that and let the great physician heal you and welcome you into his kingdom. Jesus spoke this message of this radical welcome and forgiveness for all people. And it was constantly misunderstood. And as people started to maybe understand it, they decided we want to reject that message. And Jesus would have faced this all the time. And not just his message about the kingdom was misunderstood and rejected, but who he claimed to be was ultimately misunderstood and rejected. See, Jesus didn't just go around saying, I'm a rabbi with a great message about the kingdom of God. He ultimately would come to the place where he would say, I'm not just a rabbi come to proclaim that God is doing something new in the world. 
I am God in the flesh, come to do something new in the world. I want to read an exchange that we find in John chapter 8, where we see this this heated discussion happening where Jesus is trying to, in a sort of hidden way, let the religious teachers in on the fact that he is God in the flesh and how they misunderstand and they reject and they resist his teaching. It says this, that the Jews answered him. We're in the middle of a debate here. I didn't want to read the whole thing. You should go home and read all of John chapter eight. But we're in the middle of this discussion and the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? What a misunderstanding. God in the flesh, people see him and go, I think he's a demon-possessed guy. Could you be any more wrong? I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Every great prophet that we've ever had has died. And you're saying you're never going to die? Who do you think you are? You must be out of your mind. You must be demon possessed. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died. And so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. He begins to claim this intimate connection that he has with God. He's claiming he's the greater than any prophet that they know. And now he's going to start to say, and I'm closer to God than you could imagine. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you've seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am which is the name revealed to Moses in the Old Testament, the name of God. And they knew when he said this, what he was claiming. Jesus in this moment claims, I don't just know God, I am God. I am the God who was there in the beginning of creation. And they knew what he meant, even though it's a little bit hidden for us as we read it today, because their reaction was to at this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Jesus knows what it's like to be misunderstood and to be rejected. He was God in the flesh, come to heal our brokenness, come to heal the broken world, come to bring good and beautiful things into the world. And we killed him for it. He knows what it's like to have something inside you that you think, oh, this would be so good if it got brought into the world and to have that be swallowed up by the darkness. And so let me ask you, what is, what is the thing that's on your mind right now? The, the thing that, that as I talked about creating, uh, about vision, about bringing something new into the world, what is that thing? Because some of you in here right now know what that thing is. And when I say it, there's almost like a pain that you feel. And maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you're, and you're like, like, I feel like God, God's maybe calling me to bring this thing into the world. But maybe you're not a follower of Jesus and you've never quite realized that that spark that you have, that that, that, that idea, it's not just an idea. It's actually connected to a longing that you have for the kingdom of God to come in its fullness. You don't just have an idea to help the poor. You don't just have an idea for justice. It's not just an idea that you have in a relative world of truth. It's actually linked up to a longing deep within you that you've just never had the verbiage for. But I want to tell you this morning 
that perhaps that good and beautiful thing that is, that is in you that you want to bring into the world is there because God put it there. And that instead of feeling like you have to bring that into the world all by yourself, under your own power, I'm going to make this thing happen, that you can actually rest in a different power and have a different hope because you can link that thing to the kingdom of God, which means that God will help you bring it into the world because he wants to see it happen even more than you want to see it happen. And even if it doesn't happen, even if it does get swallowed up by the darkness, you can have hope that one day that thing will find its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Sometimes I see people in the world and I talk to people and they're not believers. They're not followers of Jesus and yet they are doing good things in the world. They have these amazing visions and passions and I'm like, man, what have you misunderstood about Jesus that you don't realize that the thing that you're after, Jesus is after too? What have you misunderstood that you wouldn't realize that this thing is not just you, this thing fits so perfectly with Jesus's vision and you don't have to carry it alone. You can actually link up with this thing that is much bigger and greater and far more powerful than you could ever be. My message this morning ultimately though, isn't just this idea of Jesus gets being misunderstood. So whatever idea you have and you're misunderstood, Jesus gets you. It's not, it, doesn't, it can't just stop there. And we'd all leave here with these crazy ideas and we'd be like, oh, I, I heard that Jesus is he gonna help, he's gonna help me with whatever I wanna do. It doesn't, it doesn't end there. I think that that's the, the place where we can relate to Jesus. But ultimately we have to realize that he doesn't just understand us. He doesn't just understand what it's like to be light in the darkness. He calls us as we follow him, as we trust in him, as we desire to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, he calls us to be misunderstood. He calls us to be light in the darkness. You may be familiar with this, that Jesus in the gospel says, I am the light of the world, right? Jesus says that about himself. I am the, John says it, that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has misunderstood it. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But he also in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, says, you, us all, are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father, in heaven. Jesus was the light of the world. And now that he is gone and his spirit is here dwelling in those who trust in him, we are the light of the world. And he has to tell us this and he has to remind us, don't hide that light. Like once you have that light, don't hide it. He has to tell us that because he knows that the temptation and the pressure to hide it will be so great. He knows that when light shines into the darkness, it is misunderstood and mistreated and rejected. So he has to make sure that he tells his followers, so as you become light, don't be put off by this. This is going to happen and yet hold your light out anyways. This happens in, uh, in one of the, Paul's letters. Paul, who's a follower of Jesus. And there's this small little interaction between Paul and Peter in the book of Galatians, where it says that Peter comes to Antioch. And when he first comes there, he's eating with Gentiles who are non-Jewish people, which would have been breaking all kinds of, of Old Testament laws and regulations and tradition that they had built up. But Peter is part of this new kingdom. He's part of this new, there is now no dividing wall. We are all one in Christ. And she imagined Peter, he's in Antioch. He's like, yeah, this is great. We can eat whatever we want. We can eat with whoever we want. Everybody's welcome. And then some Jewish people come to Antioch. And Peter feels their judgment because they don't think that Peter should be eating with Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles. And Peter stops eating with the Gentiles. He was a light shining into the darkness saying, look at how humanity has been united in Christ. And yet he gets misunderstood 
and he slinks away from being the light. He hides this light, and Paul has to rebuke him. And say, what are, you, what are you doing? This is, this is what Jesus came to do, to unite us, not to create more divisions or to hold up these divisions between us, which reminds me that as we want to be light in the darkness, we've all got a little bit of high school still in us. We've all got a little bit of, I want to be with the cool kids. I want to sit at a table where the people around me, like, I want to be in the right place. I don't want to sit with certain people in the cafeteria. We've all got a little bit of that high school still in us. Peter had it in him, and he walked with Jesus for three years. He had visions telling him, Peter, it's okay to eat whatever you want. It's okay to eat with Gentiles. And still, he decided, I need to hide. I need to hide this this light. We've all got a little bit of, what will people think? Well, but I have this light, I have this thing I want to bring up, but what will people think? It's always there. And so, so a practice I want to give you this morning is super simple. This week at some point, you will hear the voice in your head say, what will people think? And in a response to that voice, I want you to imagine the words of Jesus being spoken to you. You are the light of the world. Gee, what will people, th ah, what will people think? You are the light of the world. If I love them, what will people think if I'm with them? You are the light of the world. If I say this truth in a world of relativity, relativism, post-truth, nonsense, craziness, if I stand for this truth, what will people think? I'm going to get eaten alive. You are the light of the world. What will people think is a soundtrack that plays in our brains over and over, and Jesus wants to override that soundtrack. With you are the light of the world. And you are not alone. And so as you shine, as you desire to create, as you rage against the machine, as you struggle, as you are numbered amongst the sinners and the nobodies, know that as you are mistreated and misunderstood and rejected, that you are right where Jesus wants you to be. And even better than that, he is with you in that place because he is the light who shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome him even if it doesn't understand him. Would you pray with me as I close? God, for some of us, we sense a calling on our lives. We've been beaten up and misunderstood and we have been tempted to hide, been tempted to just become apathetic. I won't be a visionary. I won't be a change maker. I'll, I'll just go with the flow. This morning, may we hear your voice gently and clearly say to us, you can't do that because you are the light of the world. God, as we desire for other people to see and understand and come into your kingdom, the way that that happens is that they see your light shining within us. God, it's our desire to be that light so that others would come to glorify you, our Father in heaven. God, make our calling crystal clear and give us the power of your Holy Spirit to walk it out. We ask for these things in the strong, resurrected name of King Jesus. Amen.